screen? Oops. Okay. Okay. Our recording's on. So now I'll, I'll re-welcome everyone out to our Active Transportation Committee meeting today. Um, I'm Mayor Joy Petro. I'm filling in for Mayor Walker, who's the normal chair. So um, today we actually have uh, two new board members that I'd also like to acknowledge. Uh, one of which is online, Mr. Dave Mon, Mayor Mon from Syracuse. So Dave, welcome to the Active Transportation Committee, as long with We've got um, uh, Jaron Robertson of UTA, and I'm not sure if he's on yet, but uh, just know that we do have two new board members. So when you see them, just uh, welcome. Okay, with that, I'd like to go ahead and move on to our minutes. Um, I, we, I need an action item here as far as adopting our minutes from the October 12th, 2022 meeting. So anyone who's had the opportunity to read them and is willing to make the motion on about it, look for I'd entertain it right now. Any motion to adopt our minutes from the October 12th meeting? Thank you. How about a second? Can I second it? Okay, I'll second it. <laughs> okay, all in favor, please say aye. Any opposed? Aye. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'll go ahead and uh, move on then. Uh, for those that don't know what the Active Transportation Committee is, I mean, basically it's a committee that was um, designed to help protect the bicycling and pedestrian traffic that has continually grown throughout the state. And um, that was uh, a committee that was formed back in May of 2012. And um, so really it's, as being part of this committee, we then want to make sure that um, we give good consent and advice to the um, all those involved. But uh, this committee is actually made up of elected officials from uh, Box Elder County, Weber, Morgan, Davis, Salt Lake, Tooele, Utah County. And we also have representatives from UDOT, UTA, and the Utah Department of Health and Bike Utah. So the Active Transportation acts as the brain trust regarding all things biking and pedestrian or walking. Um, the Active Transportation is unique in that it has voting members from all of the counties mentioned. This committee is a place to learn about the best practices we want to share our success and promote active transportation in all communities. So um, for Mr. Mon, now you know what you got yourself involved with. <laughs> um, our focus in the past years, ha uh, we have set the focus area to be the guide, to help guide our meetings. And uh, there's four primary areas that we focus on. The, which is the plan, the build, the educate, and to coordinate. And uh, with that, I'll turn the time over to Hugh, who's sitting here by me, to go over all of these areas um, so that we can have a, a more in-depth understanding. Thank you, Mayor, and uh, welcome everybody to the first meeting of the year. Good to see everyone. Just a reminder for folks in the room, uh, if you do have a comment or have something to say, please use the mics and turn them on uh, because the folks online won't be able to hear you otherwise. Uh, thanks to the reminder, Rosie, uh, who, who just reminded me of that. <laughs> so these focus areas <clears throat> have been, uh, we, we shuffled them around a, a couple of years ago. Uh, we, used to call, we used to call them goals and decided to call them focus areas because they were really informing uh, the meeting agendas, uh, as Mayor Petro said. And rallying around this plan, build, educate, and coordinate uh, sort of idea. <clears throat> um, and there's some detail in here um, on each of these. And, um, you know, really trying to continue to help communities adopt their local plans that then tie into regional planning efforts um, to improve the overall network and building, just encouraging funding and construction of priority projects uh, through shared awareness and advocacy for funding opportunities. Uh, for instance, I know Salt Lake County does a really good job of bringing folks together in this county to discuss funding opportunities for different things. <clears throat> and we try and bring that here uh, to this body as well. We talk about agency partnering, 
uh, making sure that what we're building incorporates appropriate um, Americans with Disabilities Act, accessible design, and you know, benefiting our underserved communities. And um, just after this, Mayor, if it's okay, we'll probably do introductions following my yes. thing. Is that okay? <clears throat> Great, no problem. Um, and then continue to educate. There's a lot of a, a lot of people who aren't in this room, um, and those of us that are in this room that are still learning a lot about what it means to have an appropriate network for people to get around, uh, biking and walking, or other means of rolling. And a lot of that is done by when we choose to bike and walk ourselves, right? Then we can have conversations with other folks um, and talk about uh, this issue. Uh, always highlighting the economic and health benefits <clears throat> uh, about our active transportation efforts and the symbiotic relationship with transit. Uh, uh, that wasn't me, oh, okay, okay. Oh, welcome, Andrew. And, uh, you know, uh, oftentimes there is a, a feeling that people who bike and walk uh, are not also people who drive when the reality is we're all the same people uh, by and large. And so making sure we're all educating one another uh, including those of us that drive on, on safe practices. And then lastly, coordinating on policy issues. Uh, we'll talk more about the legislative session later today, um, but there's been a request and we've talked about in the past, micromobility micro and e-bike adoption. And we'll talk more about that this year. Uh, facility maintenance, regional wayfinding and facility design best practices. So that's uh, where we were in 2022 and foresee continuing on with these focus areas in 2023. But Mayor, if it's all right, maybe I'll put it up for comments or discussion on these if anybody has a thought. We wanna, we wanna go ahead and do our introduction, so. If you, yeah, let's do that, let's get it, yeah. Okay, I apologize. I actually should have done that in the beginning when I announced our uh, two new members, but uh, why don't we go ahead and start at the far end of the room over there, yeah. And uh, if you want, you know, state your name and where you, who you represent. Hi, I'm Alex Bain. I'm with uh, UTA Planning. Uh, <clears throat> Jim Price with MAG. Miranda Jones-Cox, Government Affairs with WFRC. Ted Knowlton, De uh, Deputy Director, WFRC. Hi, I'm Andrew Gruber. I'm Executive Director here at WFRC. And I'm Joy Petro, Layton City Mayor. Hugh Van Wagenen with WFRC. Link Backrell, Morgan County Commissioner. Bartley Matthews, transportation planner with Davis County. Uh, Braden Mitchell, mayor of Riverdale City. Heidi Goodhart, active transportation manager, UDOT planning. Michaela Jordan, uh, community planner with WFRC. Jordan Chandler, WFRC staff. Go ahead. Dave Eltis, Cycling Utah. Uh, Megan Yule with AECOM. Ben Withrich, Washhead Front Regional Council staff. All right, with that, then let's, uh, if any of you. Oh, yeah, go ahead, Hugh. So we'll start with the ones online, and I guess, Jordan, are you going to lead us on that? Okay. Um, so it looks like we have Eric W., Ben Hewitt, Ben Mil Brett Milburn, Brett McKiff, Brittany Ward, Bryce Terry, Byron Head, Chris Wiltsey, Christy Dahlberg. Dave Mon, Jeff Euler, um, John Nichols, Jory Johnner, Justin Delgado, Kip Billings, Marisa Manzioni, Mark Bradley, Mayor Jepson, Miranda Jones Cox, Richard Heyer, Stephanie Tomlin, Tim Harpst, Travis Olson, Wendelin Noblock, sorry, and Heidi Goodhart. Okay, thank you. Um, so, with that, I know that uh, Hugh explained what the uh, goals or quote focus areas are. So if anyone has any questions on those or, or would want further details, uh, go ahead and I'll ask your questions. Okay, there's none in the room. Is there anyone online? Okay, seeing that there's none online also, Hugh, you did a great job then. <laughs> you explained it well. <laughs> okay, I'll go ahead and move down to our public comment portion of our meeting. So. The now is, and now is the time for anyone in the audience uh, uh, would like to make a public comment. You're welcome to go up to the podium. Please state your name and um, let us know your purpose. Hi, 
Hi, my name's Dave Iltis uh, with Cycling Utah, and I'm not sure uh, read in the news uh, lately in uh, January, uh, Mayor Aaron Mendenhall of Salt Lake City um, moved Salt Lake City and committed to becoming a vision zero city. And this followed the tragic accident uh, crash where a young girl was killed in December um, by a left turning pickup truck on uh, 21st East and 13th South. And this was um, just absolutely horrifying. Uh, so I wrote an editorial on, uh, on this, asking Salt Lake City to become a Vision Zero city, uh, which they've done. And so Vision Zero is a systems approach that um, some of the main tenets of that are that traffic deaths are preventable. Uh, you integrate human failing and approach uh, you prevent fatal and severe crashes, and you um, and saving lives is not expensive. It's an international program that um, has goals. It has a framework, and it is something that um, is really, really incredibly important. Salt Lake City is the first state or first city in Utah to adopt this. There's forty something cities across the country that have adopted this, and. So what I'm here to do is to ask, uh, since there are a number of mayors uh, in the audience today, is that you also commit and take part and become Vision Zero Cities and make every city that's part of Wasatch Front Regional Council a Vision Zero City and start that process today. Um, look at what you need to do. Um, it's, a, it's a big ask. Um, but it's something that is fits in line with what this committee does. Um, it helps to uh, basically push safety to the front of every single decision that you make, um, absolutely everything that you make, where you would put pedestrians first, then bicyclists, then uh, transit after that, and delivery vehicles, and finally you put cars sort of at the end of that, um, but you, you make safety for active transportation the number one thing. And the other big thing that's happened uh, recently is that, um, and I hope Andrew might say more about this later, is that Wasatch Front Regional Council uh, received a grant of 750000 ish from the um, U.S. Department of Transportation for Safe Streets for All, which is very similar to you know, the, the guidelines for that are very similar to Vision Zero. And I believe that's for sort of lower income areas along the Wasatch Front for planning. And I would hope that there can be coordination between WFRC and every single city that is part of this and county too, for those who are county commissioners that are here um, to make every single city and entity along the Wasatch Front a Vision Zero entity. And I would hope that you could commit to that uh, today, um, you know, to yourselves or publicly and start working on that. And again, that's a big lift. Um, tangential to that, uh, we have Draper, Salt Lake City, Park City, um, and I'm not sure Provo is or not, but bike, our bike friendly communities. And um, that would be a secondary thing to look at becoming a bike friendly community through the League of American Bicyclists. Um, that's also an extensive process, but incredibly important as well. Uh, and so um, anyway, if, if you guys, all, all the mayors here would look at committing to these programs, that would be fantastic. And then just as a side note, in terms of legislation on the Hill, um, there's a just introduced uh, House bill uh, that is a, um, would force cyclists to use a side path if there is one. This is something that we got rid of in like 2005 or so. It's a horrible bill. And um, the, uh, I hope WFRC and this committee can ask the legislator who's responsible for that to yank the bill because it's not bike safe, it's not pedestrian safe, it's a very unfriendly bill that um, just it, it worsens conditions. So thank you. Mayor, can I just offer a brief? I think Dave, Dave thank you very much. Um, Dave has been a real leader and 
cycling and safety for a long time in our community. So thank you for your work, Dave. And I think you anticipated some of the things that we're, I think we're talking about later in this meeting. Um, Mayor Hugh Kip, I think we're going to talk about the Safe Streets for All grant and some other legislative items. So is that right? Okay, great. Just one point of clarification. So on the Vision Zero, where do you go to find out information on it? I don't. Mike, do, you want, do you want to go up and for those online? Yeah, um, Vision Zero, find out more information on visionzeronetwork.org. Um, uh, it's an international program that started in Sweden and there's a whole bunch of stuff. And in fact, I think there's an upcoming webinar uh, that you can register for on how to become a Vision Zero community and what that means. So thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, question? Yeah, I have a question. Was that Vision Zero Network dot org? Dot org. Okay, thank you. And if you'd like, Hugh, we could send out more information about that uh, as a follow on to this committee if the members are interested. Okay. I think it'd be wise. Okay, so great. That, that way, if anybody wants to check into it, they can, along with the uh, bike safety or the bike safety cities. However, you say that. <laughs> okay, that'd be good. Okay. Um, speaking of legislative updates, we'll uh, go yeah, ahead Petro. and move on then. Oh, excuse me. Sorry about that. If I we're still you... in the public comment period, I'd just like to invite everyone to save a date. And that would be for Saturday, May 13th. This is Bartley Matthews with Davis County. But Saturday, May 13th, if you'll save that date, um, several organizations are coordinating with the Jordan River Commission uh, for the Golden Spoke bike event. And this is a family-friendly bike event um, that will take place on that date. <laughs> where we celebrate having 100 miles of continuous trail from Ogden to Provo. And the end of ride event right now, we're planning activities for that. It will be held in Farmington City at the Farmington Regional Park, which is next to the Legacy Events Center in Farmington. And we're, we've selected that location to celebrate 20 years of the Denver and Rio Grande rail trail that runs through Weaver and Davis counties. And so we're very excited about it. We hope that um, everyone will save that date and we can have lots of mayors ride in it with us and invite their communities to ride with us as well. But again, it's a family friendly event and we'll have a great celebration in Farmington at the end of the ride. Partly our commissioners welcome to join also. You just said mayors and I'm thinking I, Commissioner I did Fackrell might want to ride, it, didn't I? ride over from uh, Morgan County. I should say any elected official from the governor down, let's have them all come ride. <laughs> have them decorate their bike too. To, but we need a trail. <laughs> well done. Well played, Commissioner. <laughs> okay, before I move on, is there any other public comment? Okay, seeing that there's none, let's go ahead and go on to our uh, legislative update. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, I think Miranda, you're gonna give us the update on that? Yeah, thank you, okay, Thank you. Uh, well, I just, I, I'm hoping to give a little bit of an update on where we're at um, in the legislative ses session as it pertains to active transportation. So today, I think actually marks about halfway, I think of the legislative session. and. While that doesn't seem like a lot of time left, I think there's maybe 17 working days. There's a lot that can still happen. Um, and some key and critical things um, that hopefully isn't new to you all, but hopefully we'll provide a little bit more information on where it's at in the legislative process. Um, so give me just one moment. Um, many of you have uh, likely heard of Many of you have likely heard about the governor's trails proposal. Um, this was in conjunction with UDOT um, and the idea, and I'll send a handout around, um, but the idea is to provide a connecting trail network throughout the state um, and provide a ongoing funding source for active transportation. Um, Jordan, I... I can't seem to 
get my slides to pull up. So I'm gonna actually just send those over to you if you wouldn't mind pulling them up for me. Um, sorry, I'll just give me one moment. Sorry, everyone. Okay, Jordan's gonna get this pulled up so that we can see a little bit more of the, of the information. Um, so on this sheet, you can see the Utah Trail Network. Uh, it was recommended in the governor's budget for uh, two, two amounts. One is one-time funding of $55 million, and then an ongoing funding request for uh, a roughly $44 million. And what this would do is it would uh, pull funding um, or it would provide funding, it would deposit money into what would be called the Active Transportation Investment Fund. Um, what, while this has just been until now a request from the governor and uh, a UDOT budget recommendation, uh, the bill has, or the the proposal has now taken legislative form and is working its way through the legislative process. So there is a bill out currently. Thank you, Jordan. Appreciate it. Um, if you want to go to that next slide. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, the bill it has now taken bill form and is included in SB 185, which is called Transportation Amendments. This bill includes a handful of legislative changes uh, that are transportation related, but most notably includes uh, this proposal for the Active Transportation Investment Fund. Uh, the fund would take roughly 5% annually of the annual deposit into the transportation investment fund. So like I mentioned, that's estimated about $44 million this year um, and will continue to fund active transportation investments moving forward. This will allow the Transportation Commission to prioritize uh, these projects. And as it kind of mentions here on this one pager, continue to connect communities throughout the state through paved um, non-motorized uh, trail projects. You could see some of the use of funds there for planning, design, construction, maintenance, reconstruction, uh, renovation of existing paved trails um, and new, new trails. So I also mentioned that there was $55 million proposed one time. Uh, that request uh, was made from UDOT and is has been ranked by the uh, sub appropriations committee called the infrastructure and general government committee and uh, basically the way the process works is the committee gets a handful you know roughly 71 different appropriation items um, that they are being requested to fund and then ranks them decides what is most important sends that to the executive appropriations committee which will then prioritize and ultimately fund uh, fund these items. So ranked seven out of 71 is actually a, a fantastic ranking. Uh, and so we're very hopeful that uh, this will continue to move positively throughout the appropriations process for the one-time money and uh, are also hopeful that the, the bill itself, SB 185, which uh, funds the ongoing appropriation, um, will also move forward positively uh, that bill actually will be heard tomorrow morning in, uh, I believe, the Senate Transportation Committee. Uh, if anyone wants to, you know, go speak in support of the bill or or just listen into the conversation, it would be uh, worth your time. Um, so that's, uh, of course, I Andrew. I don't know if you want to add anything to this, Heidi. Of course, feel free to weigh in. I, we'd love your your perspective as well on this. So I do want to add something to Please. this um so this proposal is the most significant trail or active transportation funding proposal in utah's history and i mean that that is not hyperbole 
because this would set up an ongoing source of state funding next year, $44 million, and it would grow over time the way it's set up so that permanently we have a stable, predictable, sizable source of money for active transportation investment. I mean, seriously, people, this is a big deal, okay? The most significant in Utah's history. Um, and it, it, it really emerges from all of us working together on this. I wanna give particular credit to UDOT and to Carlos, uh, the whole UDOT team for bringing this proposal to the governor, the governor for embracing it collaboratively with all of the partners. And as Miranda said, the thing that's so great about this is it's not even asking for a new general fund appropriation request, which is harder to get legislatively. This is saying, let's take a modest piece, 5% of the significant amount of money that goes into our roadway capacity program annually and move that so that it can be used for regionally significant active transportation trail project, paved trail projects. Huge deal, huge deal. So this is why this is our top legislative priority this year. It's UDOT's top legislative priority this year to get this done really big deal. Just to be clear, this does not interfere with any of the other funding sources that are available right now. The yeah. fact that the TIF funds can be used for active transportation and TTIF funds can be used for first last mile, the funds that the cities and the counties put to transit. This would be, however, the state putting in ongoing money to trail. So I mean, at the risk of my repeating myself, wow, this is a really a big deal and we're doing everything we can to make this happen legislatively. Uh, so uh, Heidi, Stephanie, Ben, UDOT folks, do you want to comment on this or does anybody else want to comment on this? Maybe I'll just quickly comment. Um, we're really excited at UDOT to see this effort be proposed and continue forward. And we're obviously um, trying to be very nimble and figure out what the team structure might look like, how we define what this effort really is with paved family friendly um, kind of emphasis and connecting people to their destinations within their communities. So as you can see on the flyer, um, we've been very intentional about the wording, very kind of abstract about what it is exactly because we're still in, in the kind of structure of what projects might trickle forward and, and um, what the team structure looks like for the, the composition of the people that will be delivering those projects. So. And, and to Heidi's point, so, so there's a lot of work that we all have done together in planning for active transportation projects. Jim's been doing this for a long time and others of you have been working on this for a long time. So it's not like we're starting from scratch. We know what a lot of those key projects are, but the, exactly what will be funded out of this new program is something that we'll all be able to work on together as we go forward. Yeah, it's really exciting. It's really exciting. Do you wanna, um, do you wanna go ahead, do you wanna state again what time the hearing is tomorrow in what room? Yep, so the, the hearing is tomorrow morning at uh, 8 a.m. And I think it should be in um, the Senate building in room 220. Um, don't quote me on that just yet. I can verify and let everyone know once, once I'm done. But, uh, I, and I wanna reiterate kind of what Andrew Andrew's, you know, mentioned that this is big, like this is a big deal. What's also worth noting is that the legislature has started to embrace funding for active transportation over the last few years, right? Last year we saw, um, I'm not sure the, the amount, but over the past two years, we've seen nearly $75 million of one-time state surplus money going towards active transportation and towards trails. And historically that, that just hasn't, hasn't been a thing. And so um, we're, we're very happy to see this moving forward and to hopefully see that continued investment yet again this year. Let me just, and, Miranda, let me just mention one more thing. And that is that if you want to, if you want to add your name, many of you have done this already. Mm -hmm. I know, Mayor, you've done it. You've done it, Commissioner. If you want to add your name, there is a support letter thing. It's on the screen right now and presumably it will be in the chat momentarily um, that you can sign on for yourself and for your organization to express support uh, for this proposal. Now is the time to do it if you haven't done it yet, because in, in the next few days, this letter is going to be delivered to the legislature now that 
Senate Bill 185 is out and it's going to be start to be considered by the legislature. So if you haven't signed on now, please do so. Yeah, and I think uh, as of yesterday, we had somewhere close to 400 signatures on the letter, which is which is great. And um, yeah, we're looking forward to, yeah, really to share that with our legislative partners again this year. Uh, Jordan, if you do the next slide, I, I do want to just highlight a few other uh, active transportation related legislation in the legislature right now. Um, as, as, as you had mentioned, I think it's Dave, right? Dave. Uh, Dave did mention that there's a, you know, potentially problematic bill, HB 395, that so cyclist road use amendments. Um, appreciate your recommendation to maybe uh, get have WFRC get involved or at least speak with the sponsor about maybe the, the intent behind that bill. Um, there are a few others. There's a safe school routes evaluations bill. I think what's notable about this one is that it requires greater coordination between school districts, counties, and cities, um, and requiring them to work together to identify the safe route um, needs in, in our different communities, and uh, that would hopefully help them better, uh, better coordinate to, to make those improvements to those routes. Um, and then there's a there's a two there's two outdoor recreation bills from Representative uh, Jeff Stenquist. Um, nothing too notable here, um, but if you want to take a look at them, I think they're they're at least interesting to see what the Outdoor Adventure Commission um, is doing for uh, unpaved trails, for um, you know mountain bike trails in in the different communities, and the different funding that's going out. Um, for uh, recreation areas within the state. And then uh, a few funding items to note, like we mentioned, there's that one-time funding for the Active Transportation Investment Fund. Um, Bike Utah also had a few uh, appropriations requests. Uh, they had some one-time, uh, or both were would be ongoing. The e-bike incentive program, unfortunately, that one did not rank very favorably this morning in, um, in committee. I think it was near the, uh, the bottom of the list um, for the e-bike incentive program, but the ongoing thousand miles project uh, funding towards Bike Utah was actually funded. Um, nothing's ultimately funded until the, the uh, legislature puts it into an appropriations bill, but ultimately we think that should be funded on an ongoing basis for Bike Utah. So uh, there's a still potential for additional bills to be released throughout the session. Um, there's not, I don't know that there's any that we're awaiting. I don't know, Heidi, maybe you have your eye on any others. No, um, but we'll, we'll be sure to, if there is any, anything big, one of the, the places that you can keep track of the bills that are out there, WFRC has a bill tracker uh, that we keep updated throughout the week um, that has summaries and positions of the uh, of WFRC staff and our council um, for for these a number of bills and and take actions on supporting opposing or staying neutral on some of these pieces of legislation and so we'll drop that in the chat as well but you can find that under our uh, public involvement um, section of our website for those in the room that want to go ahead and take a look at that so uh, with that I think that's that's it for the legislative update. Well, Miranda, thank you very much for that update and for the details and especially the excitement <laughs> that uh, we need to get behind as far as uh, the legislation that's going on with the funding. But with that, I want to ask, is there anybody else following the, any additional bills that to, would be pertinent for this committee? Just to be sure. Okay. Well, thank you. And I don't think there's any comments online either, right? Okay, with that, let's go ahead then and uh, continue down to item number five, which is our regional transportation plan update. Um, this is a four-year plan. Uh, the four-year planning cycle for the long-range transportation plan, which will conclude in 2023. Um, we have Heidi here, uh, Goodhart with UDOT. We've got Jim Price with MAG and our own Hugh Wagner here with W. FRC, and uh, these folks will give us an update on their uh, respective agencies and the efforts to complete the plan, which ultimately will create the Utah Unified Transportation Plan. So with that, I'll go ahead and turn the time over to Heidi.
All right, thank you so much for the opportunity to talk about our long range planning efforts. Um, for those that don't know, um, obviously Wasatch Front Regional Council and MAG are responsible for planning within the metropolitan areas. Um, there's a couple other MPOs throughout the state, but then the responsibility to figure out uh, roadway planning, infrastructure, projects, phasing, um, kind of falls on, on UDOT. And so um, over the last um, three years, we've been diving back into another long range planning effort for the um, non MPO portions of, of the state. So we've been doing a lot of coordination with our rural um, partners. And um, I just wanna give kind of a, a quick little update on where we're at in that process, what we've completed, what we're working on currently, and then what's kind of upcoming. Um, I have a little list and I'll drop it into the chat to summarize um, once I'm done. But in the chat on the, for our online participants, I've added a link to UDOT's planning website. And if you go down to the long range planning tab, you can see our past uh, planning efforts, our studies, um, and kind of uh, some adopted amendments in our current process. So um, from an active transportation perspective, um, over the last three years and even prior to that, we've done a lot of coordination work with reaching out to local governments um, of all scales and kind of compiling and digitizing active transportation plans from across the state and getting them associated with a common schema. So that, that sounds like very nerdy and technical, um, but basically some of these uh, active transportation plans are like highlighter on a map. And so you can imagine that that has difficulty being transitioned into um, what we see as uh, GIS oriented, um, very fine grain, like lots of data backing them. Uh, plans. And so um, we've done a considerable amount of work uh, gathering all of those active transportation plans and studies, kind of combining them into um, a single format. And then um, two years ago, we had some consultant assistance with a statewide public engagement and outreach opportunity. So through that effort, we had about 18,000 18, individual points of feedback. 1200 comments and then 800 non-geographically coded comments that we had to go in and kind of manually figure out where they were, what they were referring to and incorporate those um, projects and, and kind of supporting documentation for rationale behind what projects we're recommending into our long range planning process. So that's considerable amount of work, a lot of engagement and feedback from across the state, which is very exciting. Um, Additionally, we've kind of tied each project in and done some analysis on our level of traffic stress, um, looking at active transportation latent demand from across the state, and um, obviously gone through and planned and prioritized and listed those projects um, accordingly. Um, We've also gone in and, as you can imagine, there's a number of projects across the state where um, they should be a component or they should be integrated in with highway projects, with roadway projects, because of just the, the nature of the, the context of that particular roadway project or how the um, active transportation facility might be a little bit more nuanced with how it's threaded through, through an area. And so in that process, we've when we've uh, identified overlapping projects. We're working through which ones need to be combined with highway projects, which ones need to be phased into the future, um, or which ones, you know, may have some nuance when it comes to forward compatibility with, you know, larger infrastructure that's that's happening. Um, and additionally, this is a more complicated item that, um, you know, we're, we're mostly completing and moving forward on is cost estimation. So um, as we all know, there's like inflated prices right now. Construction time is taking longer. It's obviously been extremely hard over the course of the summer to obtain like even concrete. Um, and so um, we're incorporating those estimated uh, price figures. <clears throat> and then um, even this morning, we had um, a meeting with uh, Region 3 and our region leadership to review active transportation projects, to review all of the projects that are incorporated within our, our long range plan um, outside of, you know, kind of the, the urban areas. And so um, over the next few weeks, we'll be meeting with each UDOT region to refine the list, make sure it's ranked appropriately, review all the projects, kind of gather all the background information, um, look where we have perhaps data gaps or items that need more bolstering within the plan. And so upcoming, 
uh, we'll be coordinating with local governments on our fiscal constraint decisions and phasing. And um, I think we're aiming to publish our final plan for public comment in June. So a lot of work that was about three or four years summarized in just a couple minutes. So I'm happy to answer any questions. And again, I'll put the summary um, in the chat for the, the record. So, okay, questions? Yeah, I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. Um, in some of this longer range planning, instead of doing traditional roads, is there anything in the plan to make the roads wider so that we can have a trail? Oh, like right of way acquisition? Or? Well, no, I'm saying, uh, I mean, you got normally has like 66 feet or 60 feet of, of roadway. Mm. Why not? And if it's only a two lane road going both directions, why not put it into the plan to have the roads wide enough to be able to support a trail then it can be taken care of all you know with highway uh, uh your snow plows but it also allows for a lane that we can put in there as a bike lane that way and i'm from a rural area mm -hmm. and we now have a shoulder that is six inches okay if we put a bicyclist on that road, you've got a car coming one way and a car coming down this way, the other opposite direction, and one has a boat behind it, somebody's gonna get killed or somebody's gonna get stopped or run off the road. And, and I think it's a major, major item that needs to be in the long range plan from all of you, Doc to make the roads wide enough to be able to have a bike lane on them or at least a, a big enough shoulder to make it a worthwhile non-vehicle road. I mean, have a, an, an additional lane for that. So just, just a thought, it's always been a pet peeve of yeah. mine ever since I became a commissioner. And I think because you got plans just for a two lane road and not for a two lane plus four feet on each side. Yeah, that's a that's a great, a great point. And it's obviously a very common consideration across the state. It's not unique to, to Morgan County for sure. Um, we are as part of this process doing identification where we have narrower shoulders and figuring out you know where we might need to incorporate some widening. Um, if it, if it makes sense to widen the shoulders or to then have, um, you know, kind of a, a decision matrix, if you will, of what vehicle speeds are, what traffic volumes are, what other, you know, like boats, are there a lot of RVs? How do we kind of um, juggle the various uses and then what the ultimate facility ends up looking like? And so in some cases, you know, we do have kind of that, that really scrambled eggs of users, if you will, um, we are looking at separating facilities and obviously incorporating that scoping into projects so that as they move forward, we're appropriately considering what the context of the roadway is. If we have widened shoulders, if we have um, a bicycle facility that's standalone, or if we you know, designate um, a multi-use trail to accommodate those uses. So we are in, in many areas, um, in, you know, figuring out what the facility needs to look like, how it's incorporated within um, the roadway kind of long range planning efforts. And then also, you know, we, we hope to re-examine all of the roadways um, as part of our, you know, future active transportation planning to figure out where we need to incorporate uh, improvements. So. I, know, I know that you, I mean, you say it's in the planning, and you go and use numbers to determine when it's being used and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. I cannot go and say when somebody wants to go on the road. We have different times of the day, even in my part of the, of the county, where, it, I mean, we have to try to choose, and I'm not going to go out there with a flashlight and go up and down the road to walk. Right. And, uh, you know, to get from one, far, one part of the farm to the other part of the farm or riding a bicycle. I think it needs to be in every single area of the state. When you're determining and planning, you need to make sure that you put in at least a shoulder, more than six inches. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I think it's a great idea and I'd highly support that as well. But anyway, any other questions? Okay, 
Heidi, can I just clarify for the sake of this body that uh, you mentioned the MPOs, MAG and WFRC. Um, we do have right Morgan County representation, Tooele County representation, and those two specific counties are part of your planning efforts. Is that accurate? Yes. Okay. Yeah, and then all of this will get zipped up and combined into the unified plan. So, kind of gives you a picture of how things work. Okay. One other thing, if I may, I know that there's some projects planned already. Uh, and it may not be into the long range, it's a short range plan. Is there any way to change those plans to where we can get a wider shoulder? Um, <laughs> yeah, at, at this point, if we haven't identified a wider shoulder or widening or, or safety improvements over time, you know, that's definitely something that can be um, addressed on the fly if there are kind of immediate safety concerns. Um, and then we can, you know, really tackle this on our, our next long range plan, given the proximity to us uh, moving forward for, for public comment, so. Are we good? Do you have more to present? Otherwise I'll have, uh, uh, what, Jim, I think was gonna go next. <laughs> Do I have control? Okay, uh, Jim Price is Mountain Land Association of Governments or MAG. It's a lot easier to say MAG. Um, it's a lot easier to say hey you than it is to say Jim sometimes. Um, we are in the midst of, as are the other MPOs in, and UDOT, in the midst of updating our long range transportation plan, our regional transportation plan. And we are, our active transportation portion of it is a little behind the time, and I, I apologize for that. We're just kind of pulling everything together and getting this ready. But the flip side of that is we usually, we actually usually do that by design because we want to, as the commissioner was talking about, we want to take advantage of the roadway planning, future roadway, increases in, in size or width or decreases in some in some cases um, to take advantage of those plans so that we can add on active transportation elements to those roadway highway plans highway projects as they come along um, can you click that I'm hoping this is going to work yay okay so it, go, go far right. Can you do that or do I have to do that? There we go. I'm sorry. Not, not the map, but the slider. Oh, sorry. That's okay. And then bring the map back to where it was. What I want to kind of show you, and this is, this is um, indicative, um, and then squeeze. I mean, I'm sorry, I'm used to doing this with my, on my iPad. <laughs> I can just, I can just pinch and zoom. Nope, that's good. Okay, so this is Utah County. Um, this is where we were about 20 years ago, as far as active transportation. And I wanted to show this, because this particular map is indicative, is illustrative of where we've come in Utah County and MAG, but it's also illustrative of where we've come and where we're going uh, statewide. You know, we're talking about the, the governor's initiative and the trails network and the funding, dedicated funding source, which again, as Andrew said, we've never had before. We've always had to do everything kind of on the fly. Uh, let's, for goodness sake, let's quit doing that. Let's, let's dedicate some funds to one of the most important pieces of our transportation network. Okay, now if you'll slide that, Jordan, from right to left. So this is where we were, well, before we did, sorry. This is where we were in Utah County in active transportation 20 year, about 20 years ago. We had the big three. We had the, the Jordan River Trail, we had the Provo River Trail, and we had the Bonneville Shoreline Trail. 
And that was pretty much it. And now in order to update our, 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 the RTP, we needed to go back and find out. We spent about a year figuring out where we are now uh, and verifying what's on the ground. Uh, can I go ahead and slide that over? So as of 2022, this is what's on the ground as far as active transportation in Utah County. Um, it's a stark difference. It's really exciting to see how much progress we've made. Um, this is what's on the ground. And then let's go to the next one. This is gonna be a little harder to illustrate because it's not such a, a cool map. Go, go ahead to the next slide. Yeah. So I have, control, I have control over that, don't I? Sorry. So we take those existing conditions and we have a great team working on that uh, from Fair and Piers and Alta Consulting. They're helping me work on this. We, we look at our existing conditions and we look at our local plan project and you can see the local plan gives us kind of a rich field from which to pick. Uh, these are, this is what's planned. These are local city plans, sorry. Um, I tend to wander and I hate, sorry, my apologies. Um, so taking what we have on the ground, taking what we have planned all over Utah County within the communities, this is the base from which we move forward to get to, this is our new draft priority existing facilities. So we take all that rich, what's on the ground and the rich choices we have based on those city plans. And we start connecting them together into a fully connected regional network where it's not just one city here and one city there, or one facility here, one facility there, but we're, we're looking to have just like we do roadways, Oh, what a weird idea to have everything connected. You can get from where you want to get, where, where you are to where you want to go anytime, anywhere. These red ones are our priority projects for the upcoming RTP. And that does take advantage. These, some of these are standalone projects, standalone trails, if you will. Some of these, in fact, a lot of these, like out here on um, SR73 out on the west side of Utah County. These will go in with road projects and take advantage of the fact that that road project is the big spender. The AT project is, is a little spender and maybe we can squeeze it in there within the budget of that roadway. Okay, any questions? This looks great for this. Utah County, are you working north as well along these same lines? <laughs> um, I'm not, but I know a lot of people who are. <laughs> yeah, we always wish Jim was working up here with us because of yeah. his experience. You can see what he's done in Utah County. Uh, so I'll follow up and give you a brief where we are uh, in parts north. Um, question I have is, um, I don't know if it was in one of the other meetings or one of my other events that I've been to, I understand that since Mag is over Wasatch area, also I think Wasatch County, Wasatch County. Correct. I understand that you're having you've got a trail that actually is going to connect them. Reach yes. in the future or right um, close future. That's well, not on your plan. <laughs> that's that's part of the plan, and that's actually also, and that will come up. We're going to talk about uh, Ben and I are going to talk about our tip project, uh, selection. And that will come up in there and, we'll, and I'll kind of give you, I'll, I'll fill in that question if we can put it off till then just for just a few minutes, Commissioner. I just thought it was a good idea to be able to connect through the mountains a trail. And that's the same thing I've been discussing with some other counties. Yeah, I, I, it's connecting the, 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 the Wasatch front, the Wasatch back, I think are crucial to both. And um, that is one thing we've been working on again, working on for a very long time. And we'll talk about that in just a sec. Thank you. Okay. 
we'll go ahead and move on then and uh, Hugh will answer my question perhaps. <laughs> yeah, pressure's on. Uh, as I was sitting there listening to Heidi and Jim, uh, it was so awesome to think a lot of our processes are the same. We've been coordinating a lot of things. And, you know, if you want to substitute uh, what Heidi said and just say she was focused on MPL areas, right, the presentation would work. Jim, same thing. Uh, so just to go over where we're at, uh, and I'll, I'll sprinkle in a little bit of the transit and roadway stuff as well, just overall for everybody here <clears throat> with ours. Uh, did you turn this off on me, Jim? There we go. That's okay. So just as a reminder, um, the Wasatch Choice vision that covers these urbanized areas uh, and beyond, uh, you know, is, is made of sort of three legs of a stool, uh, if we can call it that. And one is the economic development leg, uh, land use leg, and then a transportation leg, which is uh, the long range plans that Heidi and Jim and I are talking about uh, today. And for uh, Everything we do at the Wasatch Front are based on you know, regional goals that uh, the regional that the council set up a number of years ago, and we try and look at everything through that lens and that filter. So, <clears throat> not this is new, but just as a reminder, the the three modes we're looking at: is roadways, so vehicular movement, transit projects, and then active transportation projects. And on the roadway side, anything from new roadways to widening of roadways for additional capacity, um, could be operational projects that improve the efficiency of the existing uh, facility that's there. On the transit side, <clears throat> uh, core bus routes, uh, you know, that run at, at higher headways, uh, bus rapid transit projects, and then fixed, fixed rail projects. On the, the biking side, overpasses, underpasses, protected cycle paths uh, or protected bike lanes and multi-use trails. And this is all done in conjunction, again, with our partners at UDOT, the season counties, and, and UTA. So just really quickly, uh, Heidi mentioned fiscal constraint that you know, her plan is going into. And one of the things that we always try and do is, well, we have all these projects, but what kind of money do we expect? And again, this is through 2050, thinking about this. So we have a really crack team with Jory and Julie and others on the Unified Plan uh, Financial Subcommittee that help work through this. And we anticipate about $1.1 billion of revenue being available for active transportation projects in the WFRC region, only $18.3 billion for roadways and $6.3 billion for transit. And if we look at the money that we project coming in or being available, <clears throat> well, what does that do for the projects that we think we actually need? Um, you can see on the active transportation side, this is my laser, yep. Uh, but it doesn't work there. It doesn't work on the screens. And the active transportation side is like, wow, look, our needs. We actually don't have that much more than we do revenue. Well, right, just like both Heidi and Jim were saying, we've really tried hard to say, where can we sneak onto these roadway projects and put the cost on that project rather than our own projects? So a lot of these needs dollars um, aren't reflected in uh, what we actually need because we're sort of... Uh, you know, ciphering, or that's not the word, pilfering, stealing, I'm not sure, leveraging. Thanks, Alex, smart guy at my right. Um, to take advantage of those bigger projects. Um, then you can also see on the roadway and transit side, um, there's money being spent there, but a lot of needs uh, that, that aren't necessarily going to be met through 2050 uh, based on our current projections. So just a little bit um, more of a dive into the types of projects in our current draft plan for active transportation. So this is a chart showing facility type by miles and a neighborhood byway or bike boulevards that are called, right? These are facilities that are on uh, really low volume um, and low speed roadways. You don't need something uh, that's fully separated for somebody biking or walking. Uh, bike lane standard striping uh, in a shoulder and a buffered bike lane, again, it's just paint striping, but has uh, some extra paint buffering between the travel lane and uh, people in the bike lane. And a protected bike lane that actually provides some physical separation, um, hopefully both vertically and horizontally from uh, vehicles. And then shared use paths. You see, there's a, um, as you might expect, bike lanes, um, a lot of that going in, those are, those are easier to retrofit into our existing neighborhoods. 
and a lot of shared use paths and side paths because, <clears throat> uh, or paved trails, right, that we've been talking about. Uh, communities know what these are. Uh, they're well loved and well used and uh, a lot have been planned through our region. Moving on just a little bit. Um, <clears throat> Um, this is the roadway projects uh, throughout our region. On the left is uh, the northern part of WFRC's MPO area, and then uh, on the right, Salt Lake County and Southern Davis County. And if we overlay that with the active transportation network that's planned, uh, to answer your question, Mayor Petro, right, this is sort of where we are. And there's a lot of green on there. And some of these projects are new, some of them are upgrading existing facilities. And the vast majority of them are coming from the local plans that you all have done such a great job uh, in doing, uh, just like Jim said, right? And allowing us to pick from those projects and work with you to bring them into the regional transportation plan. And then just in our last mode, overlaying the transit projects uh, that are in our draft plan. <clears throat> so uh, we also have an interactive map uh, that is online. And you can see there's a, a little link there and hopefully Jory or somebody who's online can throw that in the chat for folks because this is a great way uh, to look at the projects in your area or places that you work or have family uh, and let them know about this. Uh, really fun tool with a lot of diff different options to filter through the type of project that you're interested in. And we encourage you to go to that website because right now we are in the middle of our public comment period for the whole plan. It runs through February 26th and on that interactive map, you can leave, you can click on a specific project that's there and leave a comment. Um, there'll be a little pop-up box. You can scroll down and leave a comment on that and that comes right to us and we're tracking all of those comments right now. And uh, you know, Heidi mentioned all the comments they got through their public outreach uh, earlier. And um, this, is, this is just one of the outreach efforts we've had. It's on the tail end of our, our process here. And uh, we'll, we'll look at all of those comments and bring back um, another draft in the spring to our regional growth committee, technical advisory committees, our regional growth committee, and then finally the regional council for review um, and, you know, fingers crossed adoption in May of 2023. That's our uh, date for adoption. And then Heidi mentioned the unified plan and how all of these plans that our respective agencies are working on are filtering up to a higher level to be the Utah's unified transportation plan. So once all, all of our agencies have adopted our respective plans, we'll then focus on bringing them all together uh, in late summer and fall of 2023 for that uh, unified transportation plan. So that's where we're at at WFRC and uh, appreciate again, our partners being uh, willing to, to chat about where they're at as well. Thanks, Mayor. this button did you i know hugh you i'm gonna turn some time back over to you also um are you gonna come back here yeah i'm happy so, to, i'm happy to do that here uh, okay I just i'll entertain here, the so question okay. here but make sure you use the mic dave you how often do you do these updates happen to the um state plan or is this i mean it's 2023 to 2050 is this every year every two three four years yeah, great question. Uh, thanks. And so this is a four-year planning cycle that we're wrapping up. So we've been working on this. Uh, the last one was adopted in 2019. However, there's plenty of opportunities for amendments during that time because we know it's a living plan. Things change. Funding opportunities change. So we do a full update every four years, which is the same with all of our with all of the agencies across the state, uh, with opportunities for amendment in between. Does that answer your question? Okay, great. I don't see any other questions. So um, I'd like to move on to um, our next topic, which is the snake, uh, safety uh, year in review and the vulnerability of uh, our, the users here. And I know that um, <clears throat> as Dave mentioned earlier in his opening comment that, you know, there's a, been a, a tragic number of people dying on our roadways and so Hugh's going to give us the uh, snapshot of people biking and walking in 2022 and a heads up on the vulnerability road use safe uh, safety assessment which is being preferred by UDOT and the safe streets and roads for all um, co comprehensive safety action plans. <laughs> Uh, so a grant was recently awarded to WRC and MAG, so 
with that, Hugh, do you want to just go ahead and get, uh, give us the details on that? Yeah, thanks, Mayor. Um, and it's a mouthful, all of those things. Yeah, that, it was. <laughs> We're involved with, um, and you know, this was a focus of this committee last year. You know, as we entered into the final months of the year, uh, with the number of fatalities that we were seeing. So, uh, I'm just going to go over briefly um, some of those, um, how, how we ended the year, and then talk about some upcoming opportunities that uh, I won't dive into, but just introduce them to you, um, and look for uh, you know additional opportunities to participate in these in the future. So um, in 2022, uh, the number of people biking that ended up dying on our roadways was 15. And so really tragic. When it comes to uh, people walking in 2022, uh, many, many more than even the, the, the 15 individuals who lost their lives on their bikes. Fifty four individuals uh, in twenty twenty two and there's a lot of attention on this because of the spike in fatalities that had increased however, um, you know this isn't necessarily a new issue uh, for those of us that are doing this so if we take the fifteen folks uh, who lost their lives and add them to everybody that lost their lives on a bike uh, from twenty seventeen through twenty twenty two you know, there's this many more folks um, and this many more families who have lost somebody uh, along the way and 44 people have died on their bikes since 2017. So again, not a, not a new problem that we're having. And when you talk about the 54 folks uh, walking um, who passed away, well, since 2017, again, a lot more folks have been uh, dying on our roads as they've been walking. So, um, <clears throat> screen keeps filling up because uh, it's just, just, just a lot of people. Uh, yeah, and it's, it's really unfortunate. So 257 people. And obviously in this committee, uh, we're, we're focused a lot on the, the vulnerable road user, which is people biking, walking, or outside of a vehicle. However, we think about again, since 2017, uh, everybody that has perished uh, just due to crash, um, right? So inside of a car or outside of a car, well, that's, that's, a lot of, that's a lot of people. And so we're obviously concerned not just about people outside of their cars, although uh, they are killed at a, a higher percentage than those inside. Still, you know, 1,710 people lost their lives since 2017 just in crashes uh, in the state. So uh, knowing this isn't just all of a sudden popping up on our radars, something's been going on. A lot of people have been working on this for a long time. Um, you know, what are some things, uh, current efforts to address safety? <clears throat> and uh, UDOT is currently undertaking what they're calling a vulnerable road user safety assessment. And this is something that's uh, being done across the nation as well. I think every DOT has been asked to do this and uh, UDOT um, is leading this one. It's a statewide look at uh, the vulnerability or you know, the safety assessment of people outside of their cars, uh, their travelings, and they've had a kickoff meeting. And uh, I know they have some stakeholders that they've identified that will be reaching out to uh, to work on this uh, some more throughout the year. I believe by the end of the year is when they're hoping to wrap this up. And we're going to invite some folks from UDOT to come in and speak to this committee uh, at a later date to give you a little bit more detail about what's going on here. Uh, and then also that was mentioned. Uh, the Safe Streets and Roads for All uh, grant um, to develop a comprehensive safety action plan. Again, so all these things that uh, Dave was talking about earlier in the meeting. And uh, MAG applied for their own action plan. WFRC applied, we applied for our own action plan. Both were awarded, which is great, along with other uh, entities in the state as well. Uh, but just for purposes uh, you know, of our geographic area, MAG and WFRC both received awards to do this. Uh, the WFRC effort will be beginning in quarter two, hopefully, of 2023. Um, now that it's been awarded, I'm not sure if it's a similar timeline for MAG, but um, thereabouts. And this is safe streets and roads for all. So this won't be specifically looking at vulnerable road users. So it'll be looking at everybody in our system. Just like I mentioned, a lot of people lose their lives in our system, um, and we're looking to improve that. So and these efforts will be complementary. Uh, and not standalone, right? They'll inform uh, one another. And again, like I said, there'll be more information 
the Safe Streets and Roads for All, that award was just announced. And so uh, do finishing paperwork and getting that going and started and hopefully have some more information for you uh, at a future date as well. And Kit Billings, who is online with our office, uh, did want to mention something um, in uh, response to, I think, a question Dave had earlier. And Kip, if you are there, I can't see you. You're just there. I am you. Thank Perfect. you. Awesome. Um, yeah, I just thought I'd mention uh, when the um, idea was brought up during the public comment about uh, setting goals uh, for uh, net zero or vision zero. Um, one of the first elements of the um, comprehensive safety action plan will be to identify a regional uh, safety goal and what shape, uh, what form will be used uh, is to be determined, but it's very likely that that could be uh, um, a Wasatch Front Regional Council function. Um, and anyway, I just wanted to mention that that uh, is one of the, the very first steps in the action plan is that goal setting. Thanks. Thanks, Kip. And I know uh, in the WFRC region, I think in the MAG region, it's not just the, the metropolitan planning areas, it's also the association of government areas. So Tooele, Morgan, Wasatch and Summit are all included. Um, so it's not just the urbanized areas as part of that. Since my counterpart Kip got to make a comment, I'd, I'd like to make one for MAG um, from our side. We're very excited about this uh, safety action plan and our intent is to integrate the safety action plan with our RTP, uh, especially the AT function. As I was looking through the awarded projects, they're very heavily skewed toward active transportation, toward um, um, protecting vulnerable users uh, all over the country. And the safety action plan, I, I think that that's where we really get focused in that phrase is action. What are we going to, what are the actions that we're going to take? And our vision of this is that we integrate the RTP, the TIP, the local funding that we have, and we come up with uh, projects that will be skewed heavily towards creating safer networks uh, in the very in the very near term. There, there's a lot of money available through this through this program, a billion dollars a year for implementation, and we would like to reach out and grab as much of that as we can uh, for our area and and implement a lot of these safety. Uh, elements. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. That was good information. And I know that all of us uh, can be behind anything that's regarding safety and eliminating any type of fatalities throughout our state. So um, I want to, I'm trying very hard to keep this move, uh, meeting going along and staying on schedule. So um, I'm going to go ahead and move on now to our active transportation project funding requests. And um, I, we have uh, Ben uh, Worthrich with WRFC, who will give our overview of our active transportation projects currently requesting funds in the WRFC. And also, uh, Jim will also give some examples of the projects that have been funded or have received fundings, both with uh, MAG, with MAG, sorry. <laughs> Uh, so anyway, Ben, do you want to go ahead and take over? Great, thank you. <clears throat> so Hugh said to be real excited because this is active transportation. Active transportation is pretty exciting. But you know what's more exciting? That is the Transportation Improvement Program or the TIP. So the TIP is an amazing document, but what the TIP does is it implements the active transportation projects that are identified in the regional transportation plan. It also implements the highways and the transit type projects. But our process, as many of you may be familiar with, is every year we have a process that begins the early part of September. 
In that early part of September, we request out from the local governments, from UDOT and UTA, we request letters of intent to submit a concept report. Now that letter of intent is a very basic document, and this is for the Wasatch Front area, the urbanized areas in Salt Lake and the Ogden Lane urban areas. That document will essentially identify the project, give a brief description, and then an estimate of what that project will cost. Then we request from that potential project sponsor that they prepare a concept report. Those are due back to us in the early part of December. Then we begin the evaluation process where we go through and identify the best projects. And then after those projects are identified and recommended, they begin the draft programs. And then that draft program implements into the draft transportation improvement program. That takes us all the way into June. Well, then we go out for public review and comment where all of that information is provided to the public during July. Then in August, we come back, we bring all that information through our committees for their approval. And then in September, federal highways and federal transit agencies have the responsibility to review those documents included in the statewide transportation improvement program. So it takes MAG, it takes CASH, it takes Dixie and WFRC and the state programs in the statewide transportation improvement program and improves those. And then that's approved in October. But our process starts all over in September prior to that uh, approval. But right now, this is where we are. We're in the project review and evaluations. And we wanted to talk just briefly about what that entails. So in our evaluation process, we have the letters of intent, we have the concept reports, we have field reviews, and we go out, we use these, these resources to gather all the information we can. We bring that information back to the technical advisory committees, that's the transcom tax, and we provide that information to them and then they make recommendations. Well, they prioritize the projects and then they make the recommendations to transcom and in transcom, makes recommendation to the regional council. And that takes us back on that chart where we were through April, May, and June. Well, so as you're aware, Wasatch Front, as far as the programs in the transportation improvement program that we talk about through the transcom tax, there's four funding programs that we utilize. There's the surface transportation program, and this is for providing funding for highways, bridges, transit capital improvements, and active transportation projects. Well, there's also a program called Congestion Mitigation Air Quality or the CMAC program. And this is for those projects that improve air quality. That could be active transportation type projects as well. Well, then there's a third program and that's Transportation Alternative Program. And this was a program that was established specifically for active transportation type improvements. And then we have a brand newcomer, and that's our carbon reduction program. And this program provides uh, for projects that'll reduce um, the carbon dioxide. He's so new, I almost forgot all about him, but not really. So those are the four programs. But today, just for this meeting, we wanna focus a little on our transportation alternative programs. So. What are the transportation alternative program type projects that we look for? What are things that are important when we're going through the project evaluations? Well, as mentioned earlier, these could be construction or planning or design, a pedestrian or bike or non-motorized type projects. Now, those improvements might include sidewalks, bicycle infrastructure, traffic calming, or lighting or other infrastructure, and safe routes to school. Now, as we go through our evaluation criteria, these types of projects, these are some of the items that we're drilling down in and we're looking specifically on the type of project, what kind of benefit that they'll bring us. Is it a regional priority? These projects are projects that you discuss in this meeting. Does it fill a gap or completes the connection, provides access to one of the transit school or an active center? Does it support the, the Wasatch Choice? Does it provide non-motorized safety benefits? Does the sponsors match exceed the minimum? These are things that help implement or elevate these types of projects. How about access to opportunities 
or the community support. So there's a lot of these factors that help us find the best project for the amount of funds that we have available to program. Lately here in the, in the Ogden Lane urban area, which is this area right here, we get about a million dollars a year to program. Now that's a, a rough estimate because it depends on what happens during the year. If we have de-obligations, meaning we have cost savings and other projects, and those funds come back into the program, or perhaps we had projects that exceeded and they came in and asked for an amendment and we put more money on that project that reduces that amount. But in a ballpark figure in the Ogden Layton area, we have about a million of program. This year we had eight projects that submitted concept reports for evaluation. Now in a real quick nutshell, here's an example of those projects. Here's three of them that we'll go through. This one here is a request from Layton City. This is the Davis Weber Canal Trail phase one. This is a bike ped facility a little longer than a half mile. Estimated project cost is 654,000 and they're requesting 327,000 plus from those TAP funds. Another project that we'd look at is the final section or phase five of the Weber River Parkway Trail. This is a little more than a mile in length. It's estimated cost is 732,000 plus. The funds being requested are 682,000 plus. The last project here that will just for an example there, this one's in far west. Now this is on a narrow two lane facility, no stripes, no markings, but this facility is everybody. Trucks, tractors, bikes, and peds are all on this road. There's in some places, there's some shoulder. In other places, there's mud puddles or there's grass, depends on what it is, or fence posts, uh, other things. Now, this project's estimated to cost a million plus dollars, but and the funds are requesting. Yes, Andrew. Well, you just mentioned a project in Layton City, yes. in our chair's uh, city. And I wonder, Mayor, if, we, if you want, we can put you on the spot and give you just a moment to comment on that project. Well, the biggest comment is, uh, yeah, hope, thank you for funding, hopefully. <laughs> no, um, this actually, that project was a very good project because it actually meets, I think, a lot of the criteria because we're looking at safe routes to schools. We're looking at um, alternative transportation. It's, it can uh, utilize both the family as well as the school kids, but you're, you're dealing with the second, um, not just a high school, but you're also dealing with the college. And on top of that, it's actually a good use of, of ground that is already, um, it's, it's on top of the canal, the Davis Weber Canal. And when you think of good use of property that's there that you might as well access and try to make the best um, use of it, this ties right into it. But more importantly, as we look forward and as we're, you're talking about all these plans, and I know that there's the three gate plan that hopefully will come back around for um, along the west side of the base, this is an, uh, could be the continuation of that project as well. So it, it's, it's kind of not only just dealing with it now, but also looking forward as far as the benefits to it. So anyway, I was, I was happy to submit this one. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Andrew. That was great there to see some of that insight. So the last one there that we were going to look at in the Weber County was the project up in Far West. This is just to show you the types of projects that we're looking at, that we're considering. Safe sidewalks, canals, trails, other opportunities to construct missing sidewalk. Now in the Salt Lake area, we had 10 projects. There we go. So just a, a kind of, and I, I might point out, so that list that you passed out is a copy or handed out is a copy on one side are the eight projects in the Ogden Layton area, and on the other side are the 10 projects from the Salt Lake area. But to review some of those projects in the Salt Lake area to give you a little flavor of what we're looking at, this project's in White City, this is a metro township, and this is the Seagull Lily Crossing at 13th East. So if you were to focus in on the intersection, this intersection has such a grade to it, just as you turn from 13th East on the Seagull, 
that they can't put the intersection or they can't put a crosswalk right at the intersection that's ADA compliant. So they've kind of fuzzed out the existing crosswalk, which is also a school crossing, and they've moved it down on Seagull Lily about 200 feet, which makes that a little dangerous for cars that are turning onto that facility and then all of a sudden have to come to a stop when the crossing guard is standing there to try to stop traffic. So this project, what they're gonna do is they're gonna redo the grade there on the north corner. They're gonna um, put the ADA ramps in and then bring the crosswalk back up to the intersection. Project estimated cost about 200,000 plus and they're requesting about 230,000 plus. Another project that is quite a large project, this is in West Valley. This is on 1300 West. As you know, and I believe this committee was in, uh, influential, is the right word to use there, to help. In the 1300 West was identified as the north-south bike facility route through the Salt Lake Valley. This project will also continue that project from 4000 South to 3300 South. It's about a mile in length. Estimated project cost 10.5 million. Holy cow, we only get 2 million in this program. Well, the funds being requested is 6.9. That still exceeds that 2 million that we potentially will have available. But what does this do? This opens up projects for that other funding that was reviewed with and identified earlier at the beginning part of this meeting, allowing these funds to be a match or allowing these funds to leverage other funds so we work with to identify good projects, utilizing all the funding resources available. Ted. Ben, can you comment on, while you're talking about other funds, can you comment on, on how uh, the applicability or eligibility of active transportation for some of those other programs, carbon reduction, CMAC, et cetera? Thank you. Thanks, Ted. So when I brought up the other, the identified those four programs that are part of the TIP. The reason for that is almost, I'd say a good 90 plus percent of all the projects that, that we evaluate and that end up getting recommended through the regional council from our technical advisory committee have active transportation components. Sometimes we do put multiple funding from different programs into the project. Sometimes a project, if it's identified as a high priority, like this one, if it was identified as a high priority project, we know this funding isn't sufficient. So what we would do is recommend it into another program to the TAC and then the TAC evaluates all of that, makes the recommendations. But we also can use our funds, all of our funds, towards matching other funds, those local, uh, now I dropped my mind, local option sales tax, um, Prop 1 funding. I know we work with Davis County, we work with Weber County, identifying projects that both organizations think or feel are priorities, so they put in half, so it doesn't wipe out their resources, and we put in half, so it doesn't wipe out our resources, and it makes us so that we can accomplish some of these larger dollar projects and extend our funds further. Does that help, Ted? Did I do all right? So just to give you, there, I mean, sometimes you see these big dollar projects, your heart drops, you think, holy cow, we're shot. This is five years of program funding we can't do. We really can. We can look at these. We can utilize our resources between the local governments, UDOT, UTA, WFRC. We work together. Maybe a couple other projects quick. Here's Kearns Township. This one here is a safe sidewalk. This is to construct missing sidewalk, curb gutter and sidewalk on both sides of the road. Estimated project costs 131,000. The funds being requested 122,000. Big fix, if you were on the site, if you went down the street level, you would see things that would make you a little nervous when you're on some of these facilities. We go out on the field review, there are times that that makes the difference. If we're out there, there's nowhere to stand and we're having traffic passes. And then a little guy comes by on his bike on his way to school, makes us all a little nervous, but helps us realize we've got some serious concerns. Maybe the last project in the Salt Lake area is in Cottonwood Heights. This is on Highland Drive. This is a bike ped facility, protected 
um, from Fort Union to Village Avenue, this half mile in length project has made it cost a little more than 2 million funds being requested, uh, just under 2 million. But these are the types of projects that are before the committees now that we're working through the evaluation process. The recommendations will come from the techs, which are made up of all the city engineers, public works and other individuals of the cities. We'll evaluate, prioritize and make recommendations to Transcom. Transcom will meet in April. We'll present that information to them. Then they present to the regional council for adoption into the draft programs. But that's where we are and any questions for WFRC? Yeah. Approximately when would these be, if they're funded or you're approving them in April-ish, when would they get built? That's an excellent question. So in the TAP funds, the TAP program is a little smaller than our other programs. So we're actually just two years out in our programming. So we program this year four projects that we will be looking at considering to construct in 24, uh, potentially pushing them to 25, depending on the environmental document and the federal process. Um, on our other programs, we're actually six years out. The STB, the CMAC, we're programming for 2029. So those pro projects, if one of these get pushed to that, generally they're pushed back a little further. Okay. I believe Ted has a question as well. Oh, thanks, Mayor Petro. I just wanted to offer one comment, which I, I think that if you're not used to the funding landscape, then listening to these kinds of presentations can, can feel a little bit like, well, how do I access these various different programs? And the, my comment is, I, if you back up and you think about the things that you've heard today, which include, hey, there's, there's a, a bill to expand funding through the UDOT, UDOT trail network that's being considered. There's the safe routes to uh, the SS4A, I'm getting the, the acronym wrong, which can unpack new funding opportunities federally. And then these programs that Ben is talking about, the basic point is the landscape for funding active transportation has gotten a lot bigger. And what we, what we see at WFRC is if communities are ready, they, they have projects they want to pursue, we want to try to help connect you with funding. And there's more funding than there has been historically. And so this is a great time to just sort of be, if I can say it, kind of greedy and go after it. And we want to help you. Uh, and you can reach out to Q or really anybody at WFRC, Ben, and let's see if we can make it happen. Maybe ambitious. There you go. Okay. <laughs> okay. Does that wrap that up then? Okay. Thank you, Ben. We appreciate that. Um, I'm going to go ahead and turn some time over to Hugh uh, regarding our other business. Yeah, I know we're running short on time. I didn't yeah. want to shortchange Jim, though. You can cut me out and let Jim just talk about a couple of his projects, if that's all right, Mayor. Okay, that is. But uh, And we can cut the, cut the stuff afterwards. I'll let people know about it in the okay. chat and uh, otherwise email, follow-up email. Okay, sorry about that, Jim. I didn't mean to cut you off there, but... Um, while you're while you're queuing up there, I just want everyone to know I, I actually do have another meeting that I got to be to by 1130. Luckily, it's here in the city. So I am going to turn the time over to you when I'm to, to uh, take charge here and then you still get to wrap up. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that's great. Okay, thank, thank, thank you for being here. Okay. Thank you. I and this is I this is such an opportunity. I always love following Ben because he lays out the whole process. He lays out all the technical aspects of that and the opportunities. And I just have, have to come up and say, and here's where we're going. Um, and I really appreciate what Ben did. MAG and WFRC have very similar processes for our TIP selection process. There are two major differences. One is that WFRC does theirs annually. MAG, we have a smaller pot of money and we do it every two years so that it gets to be a little bit more of a something to really go for. 
we in that two year time frame, we our pot of money grows to about 120 to 130 million dollars total. Um, of that, this was these are our currently oops, I asked for the mouse and then I screw things up. And I apologize. These are our currently funded tip active transportation projects all over Utah County. And, and we're really short on time. I'm not going to go through all of those. I did, I did promise the commissioner to answer a question about one in particular, and that is up Provo Canyon. And that is this project. This is a project near and dear to my heart and has been causing me uh, ulcers for the last 20 years. Um, this is Provo Canyon, we call it a gap project in many ways because there's already a Provo River, Provo Canyon Parkway that starts actually, if you started at Utah Lake and goes up Provo Canyon, it's about 15 miles long. <clears throat> there's a three mile gap between that and another project that um, I, I started on exactly 20 years ago because I found the documentation wrote a grant for about a million dollars in 2003 for this project. It was not nearly enough, so we had to do it, something else. And we built the existing trail. Let me see if I can click that off. Around the northwest side of Deer Creek in Wasatch County. So this existing project is truly a gap closer between Utah County and the, and the county line is about right here and Wasatch County. Now the fun thing and the heart-wrenching thing about this is that we've been very excited to do this for a very long time. And we've been partnering between the two counties with MAG and with UDOT and some legislators to be able to get this thing funded. In 2015, UDOT um, funded a feasibility plan as to how to get that done. I think they spent a total of about $70,000 on that feasibility plan. That feasibility plan came back and said for about four and a half million dollars, you can close this gap. That was 2015. <clears throat> We're now at 2020, 20, 2023, 2023. That cost has risen tenfold over that time. We're now at $45 million to close that gap. But I think we're going to do it. I have some confidence that we're going to do that. <clears throat> we have 35 million in the budget. We have 11 million that is currently um, being considered in many, from many different sources, trying to close that gap. We close that funding gap. This will go out to bid this year and will be built over the next two years. Any questions, any thoughts? That will be paved, yes. On the west side. On the... West side of Jordan, I mean of Deer Creek. Well, it'd be the it'll be the west side of, of Deer Creek. It'll actually it'll be on the east side of Provo River. So we'll be of the Provo River when we start at um, Vivian Park in Utah County, and then we'll cross over the river and be on the west side of the river in Wasatch County, and then going up to the dam, up to Deer Creek Dam. So it's not going to be the one that goes between the dam and up to Heaver City. Correct, that is not, the, that one's already in place. Okay, thank you very much. Oh, and, and by the way, this is one, one thing that Ted said. Oh, Andrew's still here, so I like to wear greedy. <laughs> if I can be so bold. You know why I like that term because it's sometimes I think communities are like, oh, we just need to pare back our request to just one. The money's limited. Let's just let's just offer one. 
that I would rather have you put them all in front of us. So anyway. Yeah. I've, uh, we, I've been very greedy for a very long time. And so I don't have any problem with that word. Um, the, other di the other major difference between MAG and WFRC is that we have opportunity and responsibility of programming local funds, not just federal funds. And um, some of our federal funds, our STP, Surface Transportation Program funds, we actually exchange with UDOT for state funds and those become local, so they become non-federal. And we have third and fourth quarter cent funds that are transit and transportation uh, eligible and directed, and we have the responsibility for programming those in Utah County, MAG does. And so we have gone from when I first started at MAG, uh, long time ago, um, from the majority of our funds being federal to now the large majority of our funds are non-federal. And so when we start talking about leveraging those upcoming safe streets for all uh, funds, and, and that's a lot, it's quite a bit of money. We're eligible as an MPO for 50, up to $50 million per year over the next five years. And darn it, I'm greedy enough to go after that $50 million per year. 20% um, match, that's a lot of match. But we have, but if we can leverage those big federal dollars with our local dollars, we can get a heck of a lot done. And that's what I'm really excited about with the Stay Streets for All program. Any questions? Okay, thank you. Thanks, Jim. And we are um, appreciate everybody's patience. A lot of good information today. And just for the sake of time, uh, we'll we'll put some information about the the raise grant effort that the agencies are working on for submitting by the end of the month, and uh, some information about the Davis California Mobile Active Transportation Tour that's being organized. But if I can ask uh, for somebody just to entertain a motion on closing the meeting following the open and public meetings training act i'd love to hear that motion and uh second if it could come in thank you commissioner fackrell and mayor mitchell all right thanks uh everybody approve yay all right perfect yay. we'll adjourn following the meeting uh following that video but everybody is welcome to take off uh if you don't need to see this this video again thank you for all for your time and for a great first meeting of the year we'll see you soon Oh, and if you're here, there's uh, these great bike lights from UTA. Uh, feel free to grab one or a couple um, if you're so inclined. But yeah, there's plenty of good Here's government actions and deliberations are openly conducted. Before we continue, keep in mind that this video is an overview, and exceptions may exist based on your entity type. So what's considered an open and public meeting? It's when a governing body majority meets to discuss or act upon government business. It includes the meetings sometimes referred to as workshops or executive sessions. Regular meetings, public hearings, electronic meetings, and emergency meetings are all open and public meetings. Open and public meetings don't include chance or social meetings. A public hearing is a type of open and public meeting where citizens have a reasonable opportunity to speak. Public hearings happen when a government adopts a budget or imposes or increases taxes or fees. An electronic meeting is a type of open and public meeting that's convened electronically, such as via phone or the internet. Remember, the governing body must adopt a resolution, rule, or ordinance allowing and governing electronic meetings. An open and public meeting may be closed to discuss any of the following. A person's character, competence, or health, security personnel, devices, or systems deployment, collective hmm. bargaining, litigation, purchase, sale, or lease of property if an open discussion would prevent the entity from completing the transaction on the best terms, investigations of criminal misconduct, and private or protected information per the Utah Procurement Code, including trade secrets. Two-thirds of the governing body need to vote yes, yes to close a meeting. Quick math lesson. Two divided by three equals 66.7%. Let's say your governing body has five members. If three out of the five members vote yes, that equals 60%.
which is not equal to or greater than 66.7%, which means you're one member short and instead need four out of five members to vote yes. During a closed meeting, a governing body can't interview someone applying mm. to fill an elected position, discuss filling a midterm vacancy or temporary absence, discuss the character, competence, or health of a person whose name was submitted for consideration to fill a midterm vacancy or temporary absence, or approve any ordinance, resolution, rule, regulation, contract, or appointment. If a closed meeting is discussing a person's character, competence, or health, or security personnel, devices, or systems deployment, no recording or minutes are required. However, the presiding member needs to sign a sworn written statement stating such. If the closed meeting is held for any other reason, a recording must be made. Emergency meetings may be held to discuss an urgent matter due to unforeseen circumstances. In order to hold the meeting, the best notice that's feasible is provided of the time, location, and topics to be considered. An attempt is made to contact all governing body members, and a governing body majority approves the meeting. Entities that hold regular meetings need to provide notice at least annually of the year's meeting schedule. As always, the notice must include date, time, and place. For entities that don't hold regularly scheduled regular meetings, 24 hours notice must be provided. All meetings, whether regularly scheduled in advance over the course of the year, or scheduled as needed, must provide no less than 24 hours notice of meeting agendas. Uh -huh. If a public hearing is held, public notice requirements change. Make sure to distinguish between regular meeting notice requirements and public hearing notice requirements. For regular meetings, an entity is only required to notify a newspaper and doesn't need to pay to publish a notice. For public hearings, notice must be published in at least one issue of a newspaper. If a newspaper of general circulation isn't available, written notice is posted in three public places within the entity's boundaries. Regular meetings require 24 hours notice. Public hearings require seven days notice. For both regular meetings and public hearings, written notice must be posted at the principal office of the governing body, or if no such office exists, at the building where the meeting will be held. Governing bodies must also provide notice of open and public meetings on the Public Notice website at publicnotice.utah.gov. By posting on the website and providing the email of the local newspaper, governing bodies can also meet the requirement to notify a newspaper. However, other requirements such as publishing in a newspaper still apply. Typically, posting on the Public Notice website is done by the records officer, recorder, or clerk. However, it's the governing body's responsibility to ensure notice is provided. State Archives has prepared a training manual and quick guide for owners and posters, as well as training videos that can be accessed at their website at archives.utah.gov. If your entity is increasing a fee or undergoing truth in taxation for a property tax increase, be aware that there are additional notice and posting requirements. Public meeting agendas need to include reasonably specified topics to be considered, with each topic listed under a separate agenda item on the meeting agenda. The governing body may not consider a topic in an open meeting that wasn't on the agenda. If a new topic not on the agenda is raised by the public during an open meeting, the governing body may discuss the topic. Mm -hmm. However, final action may mm. not be taken on the new topic during that meeting. Meeting minutes and an audio recording are required for all open meetings, with limited exceptions. When an open or closed meeting is required to be recorded, it must be unedited and contain all the portions of the meeting. Recordings of open meetings must be made available within three days. Every entity needs to establish procedures for the governing body's approval of minutes. Pending minutes are written minutes prepared in draft form and are subject to change before being approved by the governing body. Pending minutes must contain a clear indication, such as a draft or pending watermark, that the governing body hasn't yet approved the minutes and that they're subject to change. Pending minutes must be made available within 30 days. Approved minutes are written minutes of a meeting that have been approved by the governing body. Approved minutes are the official record of the meeting and must be made available within three business days. Whoever is responsible for taking the minutes during meetings, typically the records officer, recorder, or clerk, needs to be familiar with what OPMA requires be contained in the minutes. 
When a governing body closes a meeting, the following must be publicly announced and entered into the minutes of the open meeting at which the closed meeting was approved. The reason or reasons for holding the closed meeting, the location where the closed meeting will be held, and the vote of each member of the governing body either for or against the motion to close the meeting. The recording and any minutes must include the date, time, and location of the meeting, the names of the governing body members present and absent, and the names of all others present except where disclosure would infringe on the confidentiality necessary to fulfill the original purpose of closing the meeting. For more information, access our local government resource center at resources.auditor.utah.gov.